Hey, welcome everybody. If you are looking for the Ash Center's Democracy on the Down Ballot, Unpacking the 2022 Midterms, Voting Rights, and Local Electoral Reforms webinar, you are in the right place. We're going to give it another minute or so uh, for folks to log on, and we'll start shortly. All right, I think we're uh, going to get started. So first of all, welcome everybody, and thanks to all of you for making this uh, what I'm sure is a is a busy week uh, with travel and family. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes as we get into the program. Today's event is being recorded, and the video will be made publicly available on the Ask Center's YouTube channel. You are welcome to submit questions throughout the duration of the event. Uh, please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of submitting via the chat. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A button. So uh, a couple of opening remarks on behalf of the Ash Center. Uh, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. And again, uh, this event will be recorded for your uh, viewing uses after the live session. Uh, so the agenda. Uh, so first off to introduce myself, uh, my name is Nick Chedley Carter. I am a Reimagining Democracy Fellow at the Ash Center. Uh, we're going to start off with a welcome and introduction, uh, then going to do a national overview of direct democracy, voting rules and election administration, and party primary reform ballot initiatives. We're then going to be taking a, a deeper dive into uh, the 2022 midterms and ranked choice voting, looking both at uh, ballot initiatives that pass that will expand ranked choice voting, uh, and also the impact and results uh, in a few places that had ranked choice voting systems uh, in place this election year. Uh, we'll then be turning it over to uh, Portland, Oregon for a deep dive on a recent set of ballot measures po uh, recently passed in Portland, Oregon, and then discussion and Q&A. So uh, the format is essentially going to be some opening remarks from our panelists, and then uh, hopefully uh, allowing for time for audience question and answer. To give a little bit more specificity on the topics of focus for today, uh, we're going to be looking at voting and representation related ballot measures, um, items that have impact on how elections are conducted, election administration and representation. Uh, particularly uh, focusing on uh, ranked choice voting and proportional representation, some previewing uh, for legislative sessions at the state and local level in 2023. And most specifically, this is coming from the perspective of lawmakers, organizers, and reformers. So really, uh, Grateful to have the pre presenters that we have joining today, uh, representing three very different but very relevant organizations. So first, we're going to be hearing from Wendy Underhill, the Director of Elections and Redistricting at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Wendy has been with N NS NCSL for over a decade, first specializing in research and analysis on election issues. Next, we'll be hearing from Deb Otis. Deb is the Director of Research at FairVote. She has over a decade of experience in research and analytics and is passionate about sharing the data-driven case for why the United States needs electoral reform. And then finally, will be Jenny Lee. 
Jenny is the Deputy Director of the Coalition of Communities of Color. Previously, she was the Advocacy Director at the Asian Pacific American <clears throat> Network of Oregon, a Coalition of Communities of Color member organization. Jenny has a wide range of professional roles and experiences from serving as a Housing Policy Director at the Neighborhood Partnership uh, to public policy, pu public policy director for the Highway Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice in Honolulu. Okay, so we're going to get into the program and a special thanks to the Ash Center's events team for making this event possible and to all of the uh, guests who've joined today. And again, please feel free to use the Q&A button to submit your questions and we'll do some, some additional audience Q&A in the last 15 minutes or so of the hour. So why this particular discussion? Um, through its scholarship, uh, community events, uh, and public engagement, the Ash Center is committed to strengthening democracy at a fundamental level in the United States and around the world. Uh, this is towards realizing systems where every vote counts, and the democratic process delivers for more people. Uh, this also hopefully results in an increase in more durable civic participation and more responsive and better functioning government necessary for addressing immediate and challenging problems. So going into this, uh, the 2022 midterms, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, the backdrop of discontent and openness to change. Um, a number of surveys have pointed to um, a real public yearning for uh, reforms to how uh, elections in the United States are conducted. Um, and also keeping in mind that whereas uh, voter turnout may have been uh, particularly high this year for a midterm, uh, the United States still ranks uh, pretty low compared to other advanced democracies. Uh, as reported by the New York Times and Siena College, 71% of voters believe democracy is at risk. Uh, according to a PRI poll uh, in September, 42% uh, of U.S. adults would be open to uh, voting for a new party candidate, so outside of Democrat or Republican parties. Uh, young people in particular seemed uh, particularly open and interested in transformative electoral reform, uh, with nearly half of younger adults said they wish there were more parties to choose from. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the increasing discontent uh, amongst uh, partisans towards uh, members of the other party. And then finally, just pointing out this number from Gallup um, as of July, public confidence in the U.S. Congress being uh, at 7%, uh, particularly low in comparison to other institutions, uh, as well as other uh, entities like small businesses, which rank much higher uh, than government institutions. So obviously, a lot happened. Uh, today's presentation is not going to be as focused on the political horse race, but I think it is important to acknowledge, uh, you know, party control of the U.S. House did in, did in fact flip uh, so far, uh, has not and does not look like it's going to happen in the United States Senate. 47% uh, of eligible voters voted per the U.S. Elections, elections Project. Again, high for the United States for midterms, but uh, pretty low compared to most other advanced democracies. Over 300 state executive officers uh, were uh, elected, uh, including 36 uh, governors, 30 attorney general, and 27 secretaries of state. In states, there were over 6,000 state legislative seats decided. And finally, uh, over $16.7 billion spent on this election cycle, making it, I think, the most expensive midterm in history. So yes, a lot happened, but in some ways a lot hasn't happened. Um, so far, all US Senate incumbents uh, who ran uh, were reelected. Um, <clears throat> around a dozen or so US House incumbents lost their seats in the general election. A few others uh, did not win uh, their races in party primaries. A uh, one incumbent governor lost reelection, uh, I believe in Nevada. And Democrats gained control of three governorships 
uh, Republicans gain control of one. And then finally, in state legislatures, uh, four state legislative, changer, uh, le legislative chambers were flipped. Uh, and then finally, you know, not much uh, political change in city government uh, were most U.S. mayors not changing uh, party control. So we're going to specifically dive deeper into uh, ballot initiatives at the state and sub-state level. Uh, a quote in front of you from Lord Byron uh, commenting on Americans in the late 19th century, an unmistakable wish in the minds of the people to act directly rather than through their representatives and legislation. And since 1904, there have been more than 2,000 initiatives considered, uh, with close to half being approved. Um, in 2020 alone, there were 140 initiated and referred ballot measures certified, which is actually down a little bit from past years, the average from 2010 to 2022 being 161. Uh, that's provided uh, courtesy of Ballotpedia. Um, in addition to dozens of legislatively referred constitutional amendments uh, originating in state legislatures. So there, there were a lot of different issues, uh, marijuana legalization, uh, abortion rights, um, gambling. Um, uh, we're not going to be focusing on those ballot initiatives, but do want to acknowledge that quite a lot did happen and certainly worth some attention. Um, however, we are going to be focusing particularly on uh, outcomes that will impact election administration, uh, voting rights, uh, who can vote, and, and representation. So um, lastly, some trends that, that I uh, was keeping a close eye on uh, does seem to be increased appetite of ranked choice voting. Uh, states exploring alternatives to first past the post winner take all elections, uh, some resistance uh, to non citizen voting, uh, particularly in Ohio, uh, resistance to voter ID laws, with Arizona being a particular example, um, and generally support for early voting and election official protections. Okay, so to dive into this a bit more, uh, really excited to have uh, Wendy Underhill from the National Conference of State Legislatures uh, joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Well, thank you, Nick. I really appreciated your introduction um, of this whole topic we've got here. Uh, one of the things you said was that um, uh, I think 71% of the nation thinks that democracy is at risk, and I'll just point out that when you ask them what that means, it could mean something different to different peoples. But uh, yes, indeed, there is a, a concern about that. Um, and you also mentioned the chambers that flipped and all four of the chambers that flipped this year flipped from the Republican side to the Democratic side. On average, though, 12 um, chambers flip in any two year term uh, election cycle. So it's not a huge number, but I just thought people might like to know the, the direction in which that went. And then the last thing I wanted to say before well, actually, I should have introduced myself a little bit more. So Wendy Underhill, NCSL, we support the work of legislators and legislative staff around the country. So when you think about who's your constituent, we think of legislators and legislative staff as our constituents. And my portfolio is all about election administration and redistricting. Um, we do look at both the laws that govern these things, as well as the ballot measures themselves. So we do have the details, and I'll, I'll put them in the chat later on, for all of the measures, including those that relate to abortion, as you mentioned, and minimum wage and marijuana and that kind of thing. But my last and most important point I wanted to make before we really dove in is that the election went surprisingly well from an election administration point of view. There were fewer glitches than usual. There were fewer court cases than usual, and virtually no can candidates um, didn't concede at the end of the day. So I just want to point out that that means that our state laws did hold for this election and that our election officials, whether that the state or the local level, did a really fine job of uh, bringing this home for us. All right, so let's see if I can advance my slides here. Which one is going to do that for me? We didn't practice this part. 
There we go. Um, you mentioned this, Nick, that um, there are um, several different ways that ballot measures can get onto the ballot. And one of them is the legislature refers the measure. Another is that citizens gather enough uh, signatures to get it on the ballot that way. And that's only true in, in half the states. And then a popular referenda. If the voters are angry about something that the legislature did, they can say, we hate that new law. They can gather the signatures and get that onto the ballot. So here are the states where they can do the citizens initiative. And we've also got in uh, green New Mexico and Maryland that also have that only have popular referenda. They don't have the regular citizens initiative. And you'll notice that there's a westward trend on this. So that's kind of important to know that we've got um, more states in the West that are open to voters making their own policy decisions than states in the East. And I think that's an artifact of history. Um, all right. So you also talked, Nick, this is we, we didn't um, double check quite so much as we could have. I did want to put up this slide about how many measures there are. And the lowest portion of each of these towers is measures that were referred by the legislature. And then the next one is those that were created by citizens. And then the top teeny sliver is those that were popular referenda. So in general, as, as Nick said, the number are lower than before, but specifically the number of citizens initiatives is lower than before. Um, we had 29 of them this year. In 2020, it was 40, and I think it was 62 in the year um, in 2018. Uh, so we want to be sure that we kind of recognize that you think about citizens as potentially lawmakers of their own. Yes, but it's not easy to get onto the ballot measure. And I do now see that the number in 2018 was 62 of them. So um, now I'm going to this slide has every single ballot measure that related to election administration um, on any ballot across the nation. And I'm going to do this really quickly. Um, and, and you'll note here and on my next slide, if the state's name is in red, that means that the measure failed. And if it's in green, it means it passed. And also, if I don't say otherwise, these were referred by the legislature. So I will identify those that were done by the citizens. So um, Nebraskans uh, voted to require voter ID at the polls. And that was a citizen's initiative. It became the 36th state to um, permit that. And it's in their constitution. And now the legislature will take action on how to um, really bring that into uh, four. And then in uh, Michigan, the proposal two uh, was the most uh, comprehensive initiative of the group. Um, it was a package that had quite a number of different changes, including um, more drop boxes, some alternatives to voter ID, and some uh, changes to uh, early voting. I can tell you more if we need to. Uh, in Arizona, there was a measure that failed that would have um, made several changes to the state's uh, voter identification laws. Um, those were all related to absentee mail vote ballots. Arizonans are used to voting by absentee, and they said no to, to that measure. And in Connecticut, uh, voters approved a constitutional change that paves the way for the legislature to then enact early in-person voting. So Connecticut's legislature has an appetite to adopt early in-person voting, but their uh, constitution uh, prohibited it. And now that's no longer the case. Uh, then in Nevada, they passed a citizen initiative that will establish a top five primary uh, election and ranked choice voting for general elections. No state has this yet. Um, California has, and Washington have top two. Alaska has top four. But even in Nevada, you can't really say that they've got this yet because in Nevada, um, measures need to be approved by twice on two different general election ballots. So in 2024, presumably they will vote on this again. Ohio voted to decide uh, uh, to prohibit non-citizens from voting in local elections. Um, that's kind of a that came to the fore because New York City uh, did permit last year non-citizens to vote in local elections. So that's why that um, came to the attention of other folks. Louisiana is gonna vote on that in December as well. And then I did wanna say that Alabama enacted an amendment that would prohibit changing laws relating to the conduct of elections within six months of that election. And the reason this matters is that it's hard to change the, the law and, and have everything in place all across the state. You want things to be stable when you run into uh, election time. So now onto the next slide. Um, there were several measures that looked at how citizens' initiatives are managed in the states. And all of these on this slide came from the legislature and all of them 
were intended to put a little more structure around how citizens initiatives can be done. Uh, uh, three measures were uh, related to the threshold. So in most states, it's a 50%. If it gets the, um, over 50%, then the mm -hmm. thing is, is considered to have passed. Um, in Arkansas and South Dakota, they thought about going to 60% and they rejected it. Arizona did approve that change, but only for measures that related to raising taxes. And then Arizona also had two additional direct democracy measures. One was an effort to establish a single subject rule and that did pass. That means you can only do one thing at a time. You can't have a cornucopia of ideas and ask people to vote on it all at once. And the other was to allow the legislature to amend or repeal voter approved ballot measures if those um, ballot measures have been ruled unconstitutional. So you can imagine that you can put something out there and it could get adopted and then you realize that it's actually not constitutional. That one did fail though. So um, the legislature will not be able to adjust those. And then Colorado voted to require that the uh, legislatively referred measures that have a financial um, component must give the voters more information about what that means, depending on what um, income bracket you're in. It was uh, considered a transparency issue, I'd say, more than anything else. And I will say, I, well, I'll save that for, the, for, for this slide. Um, Number three on this slide is that more constraints on citizens initiatives um, are likely. When legislators look at citizens initiatives, they see that sometimes they're written poorly or they don't really jive with the existing stuff or they don't have as um, it's a yes, no vote instead of something that can be negotiated. So uh, legislators are more inclined to think that the way that they make laws by doing so in a representative body is the best way to do it and that they may want to constrain uh, the uh, ability of citizens to to um, gather signatures and provide uh, uh, promote their own policy choices. So it's a minor thing in the big world, but for this day's um, conversation, I think that is important that, that there may be more um, of those higher thresholds. There could be more requirement for geographic distribution of the citizens' uh, signatures, that kind of a thing to just put a little more guardrail around things. And then um, up at the top, I just wanna say that um, legislatures are very busy with looking at elections themselves. There were 3,000 bills introduced in 2021. Of those 300, actually 290 got enacted. I'm expecting a similar large number of bills this year, or I, I'm sorry, in 2023, we're still in 2022. Let's not get it too far ahead. Um, so we expect that it'll be another busy year because elections is front page news so often. And then in terms of citizens initiatives, really for, for as long as uh, they've been around, They've often addressed elections or redistricting or campaign finance or ethics or term limits. So this is a these are um, core and ongoing evergreen issues that we see um, being done in um, by citizens initiative. And that's it for me. I will put some resources from NCSL in the chat when I'm done, but um, I'm going to stop sharing. And when it's time, I'll be happy to take questions. Wendy, there, there is an immediate question. And first of all, thank you for that uh, very helpful and uh, holistic overview. Um, yeah. Dean Matland asks uh, about the uh, Arizona uh, initiative advanced by legislators to require a 60% vote on citizen initiatives. You, you sort of hit on this in terms of trends that you're seeing. Um, is that unique? And uh, are you? it sounds like you're seeing this happening in more places, the, these higher thresholds. Um, it, it's not unique to Arizona. Um, in Florida, I, you need 60% to do a constitutional amendment. And in Colorado, they did shift it. So it's 60% for constitutional amendments. That was a couple of years ago. So that question of what is the threshold is kind of um, coming to the fore. Yep. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah. We're going to get to some of these other questions about uh, voter turnout a little bit later. I think uh, others may want to weigh in on that as well. Uh, and going to turn it over to Deb Otis. Deb is the Director of Research at Fair Vote. Um, now, the impact of, of ranked choice voting on representation, on participation is, is a future conversation. I'm sure Deb would love to have it. One thing that is clear from this past year is there's certainly a lot of momentum, particularly at the sub-state level, so cities across the United States from Colorado to Maine to Virginia, uh, actively uh, pursuing implementation of, of RCV 
at the city level. Uh, to give an overview of that and a brief introduction of who she is and what she does, I'm going to turn it over to Deb Otis. Thanks so much, Nick, and thanks for hosting this. Uh, I will share my screen and have a few slides to share with you as well. Uh, so my name is Deb Otis. I am the Director of Research at FairVote. Uh, and so my team is a team of, of four people, and we get to do data analysis on election results. We get to publish research findings uh, when we learn about how election reforms are working in practice. Uh, and so what I want to talk about today is how ranked choice voting went in this November's election. Uh, we had a number of cities using ranked choice voting and a number of more cities uh, voting to enact ranked choice voting. Uh, and so Fair Vote, of course, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization um, that studies these reforms. And our sister org, Fair Vote Action, does advocacy work, like working with elected officials in order to advance ranked choice voting. Looks like I could make this full screen, maybe. All right, here we go. So ranked choice voting in the um, elections this November. Uh, so first up, millions of voters got to use ranked choice voting. And this includes some cities that already have it in place and some that were using it for the first time. So there were a dozen places. Here's a list of some of the, the larger population locations that used it. Um, Alaska and Maine used it for uh, state and federal offices. Uh, and then San Francisco, Berkeley, and another eight cities and counties use it for municipal offices. And in general, what we're seeing from these cities is these folks have been doing it. Uh, in some cases, like San Francisco, they've had it since 2004, so that's almost two decades. Uh, in Maine, this is their third cycle doing it for their uh, federal elections. And so voters are accustomed to this. Um, election administrators have uh, gotten good at, at, using, at running ranked choice voting elections. Um, they're administering these smoothly and quickly in most cases. Uh, and for voters, Voting is synonymous with ranking in these locations. Um, exit polls regularly show that voters like ranked choice voting. They want to keep it compared to their prior method. Uh, and so we just see, I, I love these elections where it's just the norm. Yeah, like there's nothing special about these. I mean, these are important elections. Like the San Francisco municipal elections, um, Oakland, California elected new mayor using ranked choice voting. These are important elections. Of course, they're consequential, but the ranked choice voting is not even the story. It is just how you vote in these cities. Uh, and so we, of course, are tracking those. We are collecting the data. Uh, by convention, most of these places release um, full ranking data. It's sometimes called a cast vote record. And it lets us see how each ballot ranked each of the candidates. And so we can do all sorts of analysis on what sort of coalitions are developing and things like that. So it's a really rich uh, data world to live in. Um, we don't have most of that cast vote record data yet, but uh, Fair Vote will be publishing more analysis on that as it comes out. I would also like to highlight our few new first time RCV use cities. There are three here. Uh, these two California cities used uh, multi-winner ranked choice voting. They use the proportional form of ranked choice voting. Uh, and I know that one of my fellow panelists is going to talk more about uh, that method and how it how it works in Portland uh, a bit later. Um, and then Corvallis, Oregon here, I'd, I'd like to highlight as a case where their county already uses ranked choice voting for county offices. The county, Benton County, started using it and uh, admins showed, that, oh, this is, this is easy. Voters like this. Uh, we can run ranked choice elections. And so Corvallis is a city in that county and they chose to opt in to ranked choice voting uh, because they already have the experience of it and see how it's working already. Uh, and so they used it for the first time this year. So these are the millions of voters who just cast ranked ballots uh, in November. Additionally, millions more voters voted to adopt ranked choice voting. So they'll get to start using it soon. And I think this ties in nicely with uh, some of the, the comments Wendy was making about these uh, ballot measures that are uh, changing our elections and expanding democracy. Uh, so um, the one that I would highlight here is Nevada down at the bottom. Uh, they This is going to be our next state to use statewide RCV, but they will need to uh, vote to pass it one more time. Uh, and so we're seeing um, a strong coalition of support coming together uh, going into 2024 when they'll vote on this again. Um, I will also highlight Evanston, Illinois. Uh, honorable mention here for 
almost our highest margin of victory ever. 82% of voters voted in favor of ranked choice voting. Uh, and so that puts them, you know, typically, you know, ranked choice wins with maybe 55 or 60% of support. And so Evanston uh, really blew the trends out of the water there. And we love to see that. And we're looking forward to more expansion of ranked choice voting through the Midwest uh, as cities around Evanston see it working and see that level of support. Um, one that I would like to see is Chicago that is holding two round elections to elect the mayor, for example. Uh, they could eliminate this, this runoff, combine it into one election, save a lot of money, reduce some of that voter fatigue and keep turnout high. Uh, so these are cities we're going to keep an eye on. All of these will be implementing ranked choice voting over the next uh, couple of years. It's sort of different timelines for each one, depending on their own circumstances. Uh, but overall, we are seeing voters choose to opt into this and elected officials embracing ranked choice voting. Almost all of these measures were placed on the ballot or referred to the ballot by a city council or a county commission or a charter commission made up of folks who were elected. Uh, and so I think we're at a point in the ranked choice voting movement where uh, voters and elected officials are coming together, working together on advancing ranked choice voting municipally. Uh, and so this is a really exciting time. Um, you'll see on my slide, I say this was eight wins out of 10 ballot measures. So there were two ballot measures where ranked choice voting was defeated. These were two counties in Washington. Um, I think some of our, our allies on the ground in Washington might have more to say about those. But what, I, what I've been hearing so far is that in those couple of areas, there were a lot of ballot questions and there was sort of a movement to vote down all of the questions. Uh, and so it it sounds like there were factors other than ranked choice voting that might have impacted the vote on ranked choice voting. Um, so I'll throw that out there. And then just a quick mention for Seattle, ranked choice voting went uh, head to head in Seattle against a different voting method called approval voting. Uh, and so this was the first time that different groups of reformers have, have kind of been on the ballot and butting heads, um, which is, it certainly is a challenge. And it's, it's not what we want to be doing because we and of course uh, approval voting supporters agree on 95 percent of everything right uh, the circumstances here in seattle led to these two questions both being on the ballot at the same time um, ranked choice voting won uh, among seattle voters by a significant margin and we see that it was the the choice of the people there to move forward with ranked choice voting next i would like to highlight uh one excellent trend that we are seeing as we track these. Um, historically, sometimes election results in the media uh, have not been great uh, for the ranked choice voting aspect. Sometimes it's been unclear how it works. And this cycle feels like we've turned a corner. Media outlets are doing a really good job. Uh, so briefly, I'll highlight two. Here's how the New York Times showed results from Maine. So they're showing their ranked choice results first round and final round with the percentages and the vote totals. Uh, and so, you know, you've got your little big at the top, who is the winner? And then you can kind of see below that if you want to see how he got there. Um, so I think this is great. The other one I'll highlight is Washington Post. Once again, two columns, first round, final round. I love what the Post did here because when they highlighted and gave a check mark to the winner, Jared Golden, it's in the final round column. So they're, they're indicating to viewers there is no winner in the first round. You get a winner in the last round. Um, and so this is this is showing how much more mainstream this reform is, as we see uh, news outlets doing a really good job, I think, of showing to voters, what was this path to victory like? What are the trends that I'm keeping an eye on? Well, first up, ranked choice voting, the, the voting method and how it interacts with good governance and the behavior in office. Um, these two names here are two representatives from Alaska and Maine, Mary Peltola and Jared Golden. And now both of these uh, were elected with ranked choice voting previously and then faced another faced a, uh, a, an election this November with ranked choice voting again. And they both behave in a centrist or bipartisan manner. And I, I'm, I'm starting to see the, these feedback loops. When you win in ranked choice voting, you need a broad coalition to get to that 50% mark in order to win. And so then you have this wider coalition behind you in office. And so folks govern as though they're representing a whole state, not just one faction. And then that good governance helps them in their next ranked choice voting election and so on. Uh, so that's one of the trends that we're seeing now that we've got multiple uh, US representatives coming through this ranked choice voting cycle. Um, another 
first time implementation can vary. Um, we see most RCV cities release their results on election night, uh, but some, some places take longer than that, perhaps because of, a, of caution when they're first implementing a new system. Uh, and it's one of the things that our org is uh, keeping track of, and uh, we're in communication with other organizations and um, elections offices to help provide best practices and, and smooth things over and make this make this really easy. With the number of places already using ranked choice voting, we're up to 60 places. There is a playbook for how to implement it. Um, election administrators are not flying blind. They're not on their own. Uh, and so that's, that's a helpful thing. Uh, and then lastly, Ranked choice voting is, is working well and is popular in a variety of contexts. You know, I, I talk about Alaska and Maine. These are sort of different models. Alaska model is the top four ranked choice voting. They use open primaries. And then Maine uses ranked choice voting in partisan primaries. So each party nominates just one person, but they do it using ranked choice voting. And then, of course, cities often use it to condense two elections into one and save a whole lot of money. And so whatever problems a location is trying to solve, one of these ranked choice voting models uh, is, is the right one. And it can vary by location, but all of them are popular with voters. All of them are delivering um, secure and transparent elections with majority supported winners. Lastly, what's next? Um, we can go through this reasonably quickly because I'm sure you're already on board, but these are great ideas. Uh, Fair Vote is going to be prioritizing working on ranked choice voting for presidential primaries. Last presidential cycle in 2020, five state Democratic parties did this. And now last time, the Democratic race was, uh, you know, the only one that was really interesting because the Republican race had the, had the incumbent running. Um, this cycle, the presidential fields are still shaping up for both parties. I'm sorry to start talking about 2024 already, uh, but this is what we are looking forward to. We would like to go beyond five states. We'd like more states to be using ranked choice voting to choose their nominees. Additionally, uh, fair vote is, I mentioned we have an advocacy arm. We are developing new congressional champions every day. Um, uh, we want to see ranked choice voting for the Senate and for Congress across the board, in particular, proportional ranked choice voting for Congress. Um, and so that's a key area that the movement is headed. And my next, the next speaker will share um, info about Portland. And you can think about how much more beneficial that will be once we can also expand that to Congress. Uh, and then lastly, here's an ambitious goal for cities. It wasn't too long ago that we had five ranked choice voting cities, and now we're over 50. So voters and elected officials across the country have multiplied that number by 10, going from five to 50. I think we can multiply it by 10 again. We can have 500 cities in the US over the next several years. Uh, and this will be enabled by uh, state legislatures passing local options bills to allow cities and towns to opt in on their own. Uh, this will be enabled by statewide ballot initiatives, letting more states join Alaska and Maine and other tactics. And so I think this is totally feasible. And in addition to uh, RCV for federal elections and RCV for presidential primaries, we can get to 500 cities in the U.S. And so this is what we at Fair Vote will be working on and that we enjoy join we invite others in the movement to join us on this as well. Uh, my email address is here. That is all I have for you right now, but thank you for keeping those questions coming in the Q&A and I will turn it back over. Thanks so much, Deb. Um, before we uh, turn it over to Jenny, um, which I'm really excited about because we'll have an opportunity to bring this to a much more localized level and dive into some of the uh, dynamics and organizing uh, that went into uh, advancing uh, some of the reforms that have been talked about. Deb, could you just give us, um, you know, obviously ranked choice didn't pass everywhere um, where, um, and it, you know, reforms haven't advanced and just a little bit of context on the politics. Uh, there was a question that came in about why, uh, for example, in Nevada, some of the funding that came in uh, being linked to uh, more conservative uh, sources. Um, so just give us your uh, take on the politics around uh, RCV uh, and then also where it's been challenging to advance it. Well, yeah, I, I saw the, this question about whether the funding is coming, you know, from a conservative source or from a liberal source. One of the interesting things in, the, in this movement is 
that it is cross-partisan. I mean, ranked choice voting is ideology neutral. Ranked choice voting will find the candidate with the broadest support among that group of voters. And so it could elect a very different type of candidate in a conservative district versus a liberal district. Uh, and so we see parts of the country where the Democratic Party is embracing this. We see parts of the country where the Republican Party is embracing this. Uh, and there's certainly funding on uh, both sides of the aisle and from plenty of centrist uh, good government types who are you know will fund ranked choice voting and other similar measures that can kind of increase the transparency and get us really voter supported outcomes instead of what we have right now it sometimes feels like voters don't really have their voices heard uh, and so the politics of this varies a lot based on your location and what type of RCV you want to get. Uh, if you want to do the open primaries with RCV, like a jungle primary where everybody runs together, it's possible you won't get as much support from the local political parties in your area, but you might get more support from other groups as well. Uh, if you're looking for municipal RCV, you're gonna get support from like a Better Business Bureau, a business community and folks interested in saving money. Uh, and fiscal responsibility. Uh, and so your coalition is going to change based on what kinds of problems you're solving. Absolutely. Um, also just want to acknowledge um, there are a number of other reforms uh, that are getting traction, for example, uh, fusion voting. Uh, and I do uh, look forward to the Ash Center uh, exploring some of these approaches in the coming months. Um, but of course, uh, today's focus, uh, we, we did want to give some time to RCV. And as Deb mentioned, uh, that possibility of getting to 500 might actually be more uh, feasible than would have been imagined a year ago. So thank you very much, Deb, and hope to hear from you in the Q&A in just a little bit. Um, so like many of you, uh, I imagine, uh, perhaps aren't sitting around all day focused on electoral reform, that there are other issues that you care deeply about, and you see uh, elections and politics is perhaps relevant to that, but uh, you, might have, you might have more immediate issues uh, in mind. Um, and so I'm going to use that to introduce Jenny Lee uh, from the Coalition of Communities of Color, where she is the deputy director, um, her organization spearheaded uh, the organizing effort around a very consequential uh, reform in Portland, Oregon, uh, that is probably the closest, at least in, in recent years, uh, to advancing a proportional voting system uh, with major implications for representation, policy, and elections. And I'll turn it over to Jenny Lee. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I am uh, needing to share my screen, so apologize for that one moment. Um, let's see. All right. Okay. There it is working. Um, all right. So very excited to talk about our experience in uh, Portland, Oregon. This November, we just won on Election Day a major ballot measure to build a stronger democracy. So. I'm with the Coalition of Communities of Color. We're an alliance of 19 culturally specific organizations, uh, primarily focused in the Portland metro area. It's a very diverse range of communication um, organizations, both across communities, as well as types of organizations. So everyone from service providers, as well as base building political organizations. So how did this become a priority for an organization uh, like the Coalition of Communities of Color, which has cared about democracy issues but has not really led on them before? And that's because so many of our members' issues are really at the local level. And I'm personally very passionate about that because so much of what shapes people's everyday lives is determined by local government. So for us, safe transportation, climate action, affordable housing and homelessness, community safety are all critical matters that affect our member organizations and the communities they represent and are deeply shaped by our city government. So what's been the problem here in Portland? There were actually two. So today I'm going to focus, of course, on voting, uh, but one of the key ones was under services and um, really a dysfunctional and archaic form of government, uh, the commission form of government. And that's important to note because this had actually been the priority for the majority of kind of the political and establishment class was going to a more efficient form of government. 
But with regard to democracy, it's founded on um, a history of exclusion in the state of Oregon. Um, under our constitution, actually, Black folks could not come to Oregon when the state was founded. And then unsurprisingly, um, that stretched throughout issues like redlining, um, severe discrimination in the city of Portland. And so that's resulted in a distribution of folks of color across the city. We're um, known as one of the whitest uh, large cities in the United States. And that means that folks both don't live in concentrated kind of ethnic communities, and then displacement has only uh, been making that situation worse. So you can see this map that looks like confetti, basically, and those represent um, blue dots, uh, non-Hispanic whites. And then across the rest of the city, you can see that there is a significant uh, dispersal on the east side and north side um, of communities of color in uh, Portland. And so this really um, has meant we've had a system where um, it's basically was uh, intended to dilute electoral power of minority communities. We have an at-large election system that we'll be phasing out, but speaking uh, where we are at this very moment, at-large elections electing four city council members and a mayor uh, using single winner, first past the post voting. And that's resulted in long time under representation. Um, in the last 110 years, only five uh, council members of color have been elected elected, um, and then only two representing that further east side of Portland, which is uh, considered the most um, under-resourced and under um, lacking in infrastructure. So as you can tell, um, perhaps guess from taking a look at this, that gerrymandering by race, even if we wanted single member districts and thought that was the ideal, we absolutely could not create a reasonable uh, minority majority district. And then moreover, I think there's a fundamental issue uh, to consider is that communities should not have to live in segregation in order to achieve representation. So, you know, um, I think a lot of the issues with the current form of the majority of elections in the US. So what was the solution that we um, arrived on? So this is going to be a really quick and inadequate uh, discussion about what are proportional elections, but essentially based on the belief that a cohesive group of voters, a community of interest, um, should win seats in a representative body in a fair proportion uh, to the votes that they win. And that um, does not happen in winner take all elections. So the system that Portland landed on would be is going to be structured as um, I'm sorry, this actually is the sample one, but for Portland, four districts uh, with three winners each um, in order to achieve this system of proportionality. And so that will um, be used through a system called proportional ranked choice voting. This is what the ballot will look like, basically like another ranked choice voting ballot where folks go through and are allowed to vote um, in their candidates in order of preference. Um, but the way the election is conducted and the votes are counted, it's going to look different. So it's um, often called single transferable vote. So starting off voting with ranked choice voting for how it looks on the ballot. But then these votes are distributed so that the um, top winner, once they hit a threshold, and in Portland's case, 25%, they will become one of the winners um, who um, gets a seat in that election. Um, but then that means because there is this threshold, there's this concept of basically extra votes. And so what do you do with those extra votes to uh, maximize the ability to um, express the preferences and choices of voters? And that is to um, redistribute those excess votes to other candidates um, in uh, based on the support that they had in the rankings. And so you can see here that the excess votes, the second most um, preferred candidate from candidate A, you know, has hit the threshold. They move over to candidate C. And now candidate C has also hit that threshold of 25 percent. So they win the second seat in this hypothetical election. You can also see that candidate D picked up some of those votes as well as candidate A's votes were moved over. So then in our next round, um, we see after um, those votes have been redistributed, we eliminate candidate E who did not come close to hitting the threshold. And then as their votes are redistributed to the remaining uh, candidate, candidate B, they also hit that threshold of 25%. 
So um, you can see that now we've elected candidate A, B, and C as the winner. We've had our two eliminations and that this is the system that through having multiple winners and using ranked choice voting, we've been able to really demonstrate who, um, how communities achieve representation in this process. So there's a lot more detail uh, to go into in that, but just wanted to give the very basic concept, you know, how it looks to the voters and then how it's calculated on the back end. So we had a huge opportunity um, in this election uh, to achieve the reforms that had been um, had been under we've been considering for a long time. As I mentioned, it was really the form of government that sparked a lot of interest. That had been um, folks had attempted to change it seven times since the 1940s. It had always failed. Um, and so a good deal of research was conducted into that, but as um, civic organizations researched this, they recognized we really needed important electoral reforms. So we conducted both policy research and partnership with other organizations on this. And we also conducted our own public opinion research, which really demonstrated there was a historic low in the perception of Portland being on the wrong track, which meant this was really the opportunity for change. And so, how it ended up on the ballot, we had one of those um, unusual circumstances where we actually had a convening of our decennial charter review commission. So that's 20 volunteers who were actually appointed um, and not elected, and they were charged with um, they're charged with reviewing the charter every 10 years. But in this case, it was pretty commonly understood that they were going to dig in on these more fundamental issues of the form of government. And so they're immensely powerful and that if they had 15 out of the 20 commission members vote yes for a recommendation, that it could go uh, directly to the ballot. So we really took this opportunity to seize the moment um, to go over the chance for um, communities of color to win a system that worked for both them and everybody else who's experienced underrepresentation. We engaged in a community engagement partnership with the city where we were really able to have deep conversations about how folks engaged with government and elections. Conducted uh, research and policy development, advocated before um, for that before the commission, and also ran two polls in order to um, understand was this viable. And what we found out was that people love ranked choice voting and they love districts. So those were two of the things we had a really compelling case for, despite folks thinking, oh, it might be too complicated. It actually really uh, resonated with voters. So getting to very briefly on the campaign, um, we ran a campaign called Portland United for Change. We built a major coalition with community-based organizations and um, led by folks of color as leadership. We also, in addition to bringing on other racial justice organizations, service providers, um, good government groups, labor, small business, and then also great representation who put from political science professors, which for those of you in academia, we pulled this, you're actually one of our most compelling messengers. So we leaned in a lot on having political science professors um, as academics. So believe it or not, your opinion um, actually does matter, or at least in Portland. So we ran the components of a full-blown campaign um, field, so lots of door knocking, canvassing, um, digital ads, and mailers. We relied on key messages, um, one of those being uh, particularly relevant to ranked choice voting, more choice and more choice, talking about everyone having a seat at the table. Those were all uh, extremely popular uh, tested, um, poll tested um, uh, messages. We also ran, um, really had to push to get a strong narrative in the earned media, and then also fundraising. We actually ended up raising over $1 million, uh, both with support from national organizations, so thank you uh, to those folks, as well as a lot of in-kind contributions from community-based organizations, as well as straight up cash, because that's how important this was um, as a priority to us organizationally. We also did face opposition from really the old guard kind of political class. And then toward the end of the campaign, um, folks were, who were for it before they were against us ended up dumping in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, finally hired, you know, really within the last couple of weeks, um, a political, competent political consultants, blasted mail out there. Um, with a strategy uh, proposing there'd be this alternative plan that folks could pick, and it would just be on the May 2023 ballot with a council referral. So really a misleading and um, false choice for voters, but we kept it focused on a, a very positive and hopeful campaign that these proposals would benefit all of us. 
So we won on November 8th with 58% of the vote. That same night, uh, we also saw a uh, ranked choice voting pass in Multnomah County, where Portland is located, um, pushing close to, um, you know, in the high 60s. Uh, so really saw a lot of support, um, despite the opposition that sought to erode um, what we were seeking to do in, um, in the city of Portland. So a multi-generational effort, strong advocacy from both youth and um, older folks, um, and I think really brought folks together. This was multiracial and um, really represented the future of Portland and bringing folks together. So on our next steps, we are working really hard on the district commission that is going to draw the lines for those four districts. Coming up, as you can see, deadlines very soon. If you've got any friends in Portland, please tell them to apply. And then also going into the next two years, um, implementation oversight, 20, November 2024 will be our first elections using the new system. We'll also see the new form of government come in in January 2025, advisory bodies, um, getting good folks onto those, playing political defense with those who are still considering um, something in May 2023. We'll be fighting uh, that hard. Um, hopefully we'll not be seeing anything on that. And then finally, uh, getting uh, folks ready, training up, um, successful implementation, but also supporting candidates to run in the November 2024 elections. So uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I know that was a lot in there, but I uh, just want to show both what solution we arrived on that fit for Portland and also a little bit about how we got it passed. If you do have any questions, um, here is my email address as well. So thank you so much um, for us to uh, share the story of our victory for democracy this year. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, one question um, taken from Andrew uh, Doty, um, and specifically for, for Jenny and Deb, but also Wendy would love your perspective too, um, how to uh, address confusion around these reforms. Um, this is, it's exciting uh, stuff, but surely, particularly when you have multiple candidates, uh, that there is going to be a lack of uh, familiarity with these reforms. And Deb, how have you dealt with that in your experience in the past? And then Jenny, how are you thinking about that uh, for next steps in Portland? Well, ultimately, we found voters are used to ranking things in every context except elections, right? If the ice cream shop is out of the flavor I wanted, I know what I'll get as my second choice. Uh, and so it, it explaining this and making this very clear comes down to making it about the voters experience it's not about some algorithm that's going to start transferring your votes around it's about you get to rank your candidates on a ballot don't you know who your second choice is and wouldn't it be nice to be able to express that preference uh, and then you we get into the technical details as they're needed and as people ask but you don't lead with uh, you know the runoff aspect of this we lead with you get the freedom to rank. Um, so that's been our experience so far. Uh, anyone else? I'll just jump in to say that, you know, we really found that early on, this was a concern that's often um, raised by opponents, but immediately talking to, you know, community-based organizations, for example, serving, um, you know, organizing immigrant communities. So th this is exactly how we do things too. We rank folks, um, we rank priorities by preference. So we were, um, we're very optimistic, just it's going to take a lot of outreach, but we developed um, a lot of great communications materials. And I think we'll have a really strong partnership with the county who um, is responsible for voter outreach, but we absolutely will need resources for that. So already working on next year's budget um, and getting those resources in there. You know, Wendy, you um, interface a lot with lawmakers and their staff. Um, what are concerns that you often hear from them about uh, election reforms and administration that might not be getting enough or might, might not get enough attention or traction elsewhere? Like what is top of mind for the people that you are serving when they're contemplating whether to uh, support or not uh, some of these uh, reforms that we've been discussing? And I, I was so struck by um, uh, Deb's presentation with the advancement of ranked choice voting from five to 50 and 50, potentially up to 500. So I will just offer that five years ago when ranked choice voting came up, the question was always, what is that? And I'm not hearing that from legislators anymore. They are familiar, generally speaking, with it in its broadest of terms. They may not see it as applicable in their own 
uh, jurisdiction. They they um, have other things that are probably top of mind, which is either voter convenience or it could be um, election security. Those might be uh, top. So it's probably someone on the outside who's going to bring into them the idea of, of ranked choice voting. And Deb did say that, that um, states could do something that's permissive. Um, and there are plenty of states where there is um, uh, home rule, so a city can adopt it uh, without the legislature uh, doing anything at all. Um, so I guess, and then I would offer that that they want to be sure if they're going to support ranked choice voting, that they know that it's going to work for all of the constituents, that, that you don't have to be super smart to be able to vote it. Um, and that it's going to be counted accurately and that their their needs as politicians will, will be met through that kind of system. So a lot of the same questions I think the public would have, but the uh, level of, of understanding continues to go up at the same time that the number of cities and, and now two states have adopted it goes up as well. Thank you, Wendy. Um, they're related to, um, administration. Um, it's one thing to pass something. It's it's another to actually implement it uh, and for it to last. Um, you know, Deb, there's there were a couple of states that had RCV systems in place. Um, Alaska, for example, comes to mind. Um, you also have party primaries that use RCV. Um, when it comes to sort of the implementation of these reforms, are there are areas that you um, that typically people struggle with and do warrant much more attention, or generally, you know, has implementation gone smoothly? I guess it would depend on the state, the county, the city. But you know, once these bills move forward, um, how uh, what to expect on that front? Uh, implementation in, let's call it the modern era, has usually gone smoothly. Um, one of the sticking points can be the elections technology. Um, if you are in a city or a state that uses an electronic tabulating machine to count the ballots, and if your machine is more than about 15 years old, there's a chance that it does not have ranked choice capabilities already built into it. Um, if you're using a, a more modern machine, um, any machines that are coming out now from the major manufacturers all have this capability. Uh, but for some places that are maybe using older machines, um, they might need to be doing upgrades. And now time is on your side on this one. If you are using a machine that's a couple of decades old, it's likely that in your budget over the next five years, you probably are planning to upgrade that anyway. And so I, I recommend that people kind of time their ranked choice voting implementation with their existing um, technology upgrades. Uh, and so that's the, the thing that, that holds some folks back and maybe can make implementation take an extra year or two. But in most places around the country, especially if you're using modern updated machines that are good on election security, um, you've already got ranked choice capability built in. Thank you, Deb. Um, Wendy, were you going to uh, say something earlier? Yeah, I, I should have put this at the top when you said what are legislators thinking about. One thing they want to know is, are the votes going to be counted quickly? If it takes longer to count the votes, that matters. Um, so I know uh, Deb is working on that and the technology is changing over time. But but when you see delayed results because of ranked choice voting, and I'm thinking New York City and the state of Alaska, um, it, it makes elected people think, I got to have my party now. <laughs> Don't make me wait for my party. Um, okay. Well, I know we're uh, we're a couple minutes over our allotted hour. Perhaps just to close, um, just uh, to remind uh, participants uh, your some of your immediate priorities um, for the year ahead um, and what folks should be looking out for in terms of next steps from your respective organizations. Jenny, I saw some of your uh, next steps in Oregon. Um, but yeah, let's close with uh, some immediate next steps. This could be research, campaigns, efforts that you are uh, involved with um, that people should keep an eye out for in the months to come. Uh, Jenny, do you want to kick us off? Sorry, I was just answering a couple of the Q&A as well. We're still here, but I um, 
I just, uh, so we will be working on state ranked choice voting for presidential and congressional races. We're also excited to see if there are other jurisdictions interested, whether it's ranked choice or um, proportional representation, ideally. And then we'll be very focused on implementation of this um, for the you know next two years and beyond. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Deb? Uh, at Fair Vote, we are going to be working on uh, ranked choice voting for presidential primaries uh, in partnership with Jenny and her team uh, in, in Oregon, for sure. Um, we're going to be working on uh, making the case for why we need the Fair Representation Act for Congress. And so that is the proportional ranked choice voting that they have in Portland, but bringing it to our congressional districts. Uh, so those are a couple of the things that we're looking forward to and some areas for growth. Thank and you, for me, um, I, I'm going to be hopefully providing what legislators are interested in. So whatever they want to ask me about, we'll, we'll figure it out. We will be updating our ranked choice voting page shortly. But but really, it's about security. People still want to know what are we doing to ensure that that there's no tampering going on in any way, shape or form, whether it's foreign or or domestic and um, accuracy. Do we do we know for sure that every vote is counted exactly so? And it's interesting to see the different ways that states can uh, do that, including Florida, which in some jurisdictions, they actually run the tabulation on two different different sets of equipment to see if they get the same answer. And then I'm communicating about elections because elections is all of a sudden something that we used to think was in the background. It's now in the foreground. So legislators are interested in how to share with their constituents um, what's going on in the election field. Wonderful. Wendy, Deb, and Jenny, thanks so much for uh, taking the time and your preparation thanks for today. Uh, thanks to the audience. Apologies if we didn't get to your question, but uh, we hope to revisit many of these topics in future sessions. And the Ash Center is committed to uh, facilitating uh, this exchange of ideas. Uh, there are other reforms that we hope to bring some attention to uh, and uh, welcome uh, your suggestions uh, on ideas uh, that you might be working on or see a lot of merit uh, in. And I think that will close out uh, this session. Uh, and very special thanks to the Ash Center events team uh, for facilitating and making this conversation possible. Awesome.